You are listening to Many Lumens, where we talk about and find meaning in the intersections of art, social change, and popular culture. I'm your host, Mayori Carmel Holmes. In this conversation, I am joined by the filmmaker and artist, Arthur Jaffa. We talk about freedom, collective action as counterculture, the Black cinematic trajectory, and the importance of geography informing our pictorial and musical traditions. Welcome, AJ, to our new podcast, Mini Lumens. In preparation for this interview, I was, I don't know if you remember when we did an interview in 2014, (laughs) <laughs> back when we thought we were going to launch a podcast that didn't have a name. And so much has changed, but I right. really appreciate that you were able to connect for this one. The first question I wanted to ask you is, how did your parents settle on your name, and where does Jaffa come from? Uh, <laughs> how did they settle my name? Well, I'm a third. I'm the third. And my son is the fourth. Uh, Jaffa is actually, truth be told, my middle name. Uh, everybody uh, called my grandfather, my father's father, Jaffa. Just you know, it's just what everybody knew him as Jaffa. Mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, I'm not really sure per se. If uh, I mean, I looked into it in the past. I've been told two things. I've been told it's Arabic, and I've also been told it's Jewish. Mm-hmm. There's a Jaffa oranges, say for example, which is spelled J A F A. Yeah, and Yafa but, in Palestine uh, as well. Yeah, exactly. But there's also a um, a J for J A F A. Sometimes it's spelled J A F A I, which means the crows of Arabia. And these were like the black sons and daughters of Arabic uh, traders, I guess, who had taken uh, African women as wives, you know, sub-Saharan African women as wives. Mm-hmm. And they sort of had these mixed race kids who were very dark, you know, by comparison to Ar- Arabic folks. So, um, so you know, so I don't know. I, I, I hadn't, I didn't really pursue it, you know, like so super intensely. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm not sure, you know, it was always my grandfather's name. People often pronounce it as Arthur Jaffa and it's not Jaffa, it's Jaffa. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But I was I just I sort of stopped correcting people at a certain point. But it's definitely Jaffa with a hard A. Yeah, so. and so you don't know where he got the name from either. And was it his given name or was it like a a, a nickname? No, no, no. It was his given name. Okay. on his birth certificate and all of that. So I'm not, you know, but I'm not sure beyond that. You know, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I has it to say. But like a lot of people from Mississippi, you know, there's some Native American stuff also running through there. Mm-hmm. Some here and there. I think, you know, this is like, you know, the mythic. Yeah, my grandmother, never the grandfather. <laughs> my grandmother <laughs> was, was a Native American. You know what I mean? So I do think my grandfather's mom was half uh, mm-hmm. Native American, is what I heard. But you know what I mean? You hear that all the time. Yeah. yeah. So. Great. So anyway. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I always like to ask because I find names so instructive and for any people, yeah. but especially for uh, Black Americans, right? Because it's it yeah, says definitely. so much about place and uh, agency and, and many other things. So um, thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's the whole, the whole intentionality thing around choosing your name, which is a big African-American trope, of course. So there's that, that, that part of it, the intentionality of it. But by the same token, you know, people have these names that don't seem to be connected beyond some sort of mythic, which is not, you know, that's real too. Mm-hmm. Mythic understandings of where we came from, I think are just as legitimate as, you know, whatever, some sort of genetic test or something like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah. um, but I, I always felt like my name is a little of both, you know, because I was born with it. But, it, you know, there is a level of intentionality around you know, you know, using that as my name. I've sort of used it pretty much since I was, you know, an adult. Um, what or whom gave you permission to consider yourself an artist? Uh, I don't know. When people ask me what I do sometimes, I, I typically say uh, would be artists, I guess, or so-called artists, you know. I'm very ambivalent about the term. I mean, on one hand, super matter of fact, is my vocation at this point, but 
you know, in the capital A artists, I, I don't know, you know, I'm so ambivalent about so much of the baggage that's attached to being an artist, you know, it's, um, you know, there's two artists. There's the artist, meaning anybody who does anything with any sort of, you know, artfulness or expertise, you know what I mean? So you could be, you know, uh, uh, you know, a swimming guard and be an artist, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like a swimming guard and be an artist. But, um, but there's the, you know, the capital A artist, which is like meaning a fine artist, you know, not a person who aspires to the state of the status of the artist. But so, you know, the whole fine artist thing is, you know, I'm, I'm a little ambivalent about it just because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just interested in things, you know, I'm interested in a lot of different kinds of things. I'm particularly interested in expressive things or uh, conceptual things. Uh, I think black people were things. I oftentimes refer to myself as a thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and some, you know, as a black American, as a black person, I feel like there, because we were not human beings, so to speak, you know, for how many several hundred years, um, in the context that engendered us, it's like, you know, we all have a kind of, I think, a really complicated relationship to things, you know. I mean, we don't, you know, in the sort of Western, you know, construction or formulation of subjects and objects, I think we're a bit of neither, you know, mm-hmm. or, or comfortably neither, so either or. or so um, we exist in this quasi-relationship between the classic subject and the classic object. So, and I think so much of... Uh, uh, the sort of way our psyches are configured or oriented, you know, is, um, you know, side effect of that, you know, everything from Du Bois's double consciousness to, as I like to say, trouble consciousness, because I think it's more <laughs> than, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, mm-hmm. it's triplet and quadruplet and everything else in between, you know? Mm. So I like to, sometimes that we operate with a certain kind of, Almost stereoscopic cognition, just because, you know, just like any sort of binocular view, it uh, gives you depth perception. So I like to feel like cognitively, you know, a big part of the way Black people process the world is a consequence of being situated in two spaces cognitively simultaneously and how that creates a certain kind of depth perception, you know, so yeah. anyway. That's really great. I'm, I'm going to quote you on the trouble consciousness moving forward. I have a question for you, believe it or not, that is saying that I gather a lot of your eventual works are derived from your obsessions <laughs> and um, perhaps becoming fixated on a thing. <laughs> and so my question was, would you agree? Um, <laughs> but I appreciate you um, thinking about, I don't even want to say objectivity because this isn't exactly that, but it's really subjugation. And that's not really a question. I just wanted to share that. That was next. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, obsessions is like, you know, I guess you some is designated an obsession, you know, when there's a sort of internal compulsion to be focused on it. You know what I mean? Because, mm-hmm. you know, you have to, I mean, everybody focuses on things. It's hard to be successful in anything if you don't, if you don't have the ability to focus on it. But I guess it's called an obsession if, it doesn't seem, it seems to be untethered from any sort of external verification or external, um, you know, justification. But I don't even know if that's true. Like, if you think of a person being obsessed with somebody else, it's totally external, you know. But I guess you would say it's an obsession if the other person wasn't reciprocating, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So in that way, there's a sort of internal dimension, internal internal drive around this thing. But I don't know anybody who's like really good at anything, whether it's Prince or Michael Jackson or Michael Jordan or LeBron, who doesn't uh, exhibit a very pronounced degree of, you know, obsession, let's mm-hmm. say, with what they do, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, but obsession is like a given. I mean, just like I think conceptualization is a given for black folks. You know, I was just telling somebody the other day, 
they were asking me, oh, do you see yourself as a conceptual artist? And I was like, yeah, particularly because for so long, all the things that I sort of was envisioning or creating, so to speak, were immaterial because they were just in my head, you mm-hmm. know? I mean, I think anybody who knows me has heard me, you know what I mean, spiral out on some movie I want to make or mm-hmm. something like that. And it's just, you know, they were just ideas for so long. And I think, you know, if you're enslaved, and you imagine yourself as a human being, that's a conceptual project, first and foremost. And, you know, in the absence of being able to fully implement it, you know what I mean? Like one's humanity or a certain one's citizenship or one's, uh, uh, you know, inalienable rights. It was largely a conceptual project. And I think, you know, Black folks, I think it's one of the divining characteristics of, like, Black being is like this sort of split or schism between how we understand ourselves and how the world understands us, you know, it's a radical schism between the two. It has been for several hundred years. So, um, you know, and like increasingly, or I've often, you know, voice that I feel like black folks, you know, I almost like a kind of canary in the mind chef with regard to like, you know, Western civilization and stuff. Like, I think a lot of the things that, are becoming uh, emblematic of the, this time, you know what I mean? Like migrant crisis, uh, you know, dissolution of, you know, traditional family structure, all this kind of stuff. These are all things that were formative components of Black being, you know? I mean, that moment, that mythic or ontological moment in which African people ceased being just African people and became Black, because they weren't Black people when they first got here, you know what I mean? Right. So. At some point, African people, you know, an African woman gave birth to a black child. Mm -hmm. And that that was a real thing, you know. So, like, these components and these things that are part and parcel uh, are sort of like, they're not software for us. They're hardware for us or firmware for us. Mm -hmm. These things which are, um, you know, like fundamental, like, givens or black beings you know, are increasingly becoming, you know, givens for, like, many, many, many people in the world, you know? So, in a way, I think, you know, there's a kind of um, almost paradoxical way in which Black beings, you know, in the face of anti-Blackness are both the sort of, you know, emblems of a certain kind of abjection, you know? Uh, wretched of the earth, all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, paradoxically, some sort of um, emblem of, um, you know, La Luda Continuous, some, some kind of almost preternatural resistance to that saying, you know, anti-Blackness. And it's almost like people see Black people's ability to not just survive, but thrive in so many different kinds of ways. And in a sense, because we're further along the path of these, you know, some maladies of Western civilization, I think, you know, we give people hope, but we, you know, provide or at least suggest certain kinds of uh, paradigms and certain kinds of possibilities to how you navigate, you know, these things. Um, I think it's the basis of why everybody is interested in Black music, because Black music being sort of dominant expressive modality of black folks is saturated with these very things so i think you know everybody can feel that they can feel in the music that the music is grounded and saturated with you know this abjection and but by the same token they see that we made something of you know Mm -hmm. so i think beyond you know like the sort of quote-unquote sonic a musical genius of it, you know what I mean? There's this sort of um, uh, existential dimension of it, you know, Black music that I think is inherently uh, mesmerizing to folks, everybody, you know, everybody. How did you make a transition from wanting to be an architect to to filmmaking? Um, How did I make the transition? Not very successfully. (laughs) (laughs) I remember distinctly telling my dad, I think, towards my junior year, hey, dad, I think I'd rather be a failed art, a failed filmmaker than a failed architect, you know? 
uh, I couldn't like, it was very hard for me to sort of grasp a trajectory that was going to land me where I wanted to land as an architect. I'd always loved architecture. You know, I played with Lincoln Logs and Lego Blocks from when I was couldn't barely speak, you know. And I just had always wanted to be an architect. But And it's still my first love, you know. Uh, but uh, it's very, you know, outside of film, maybe even more so than film, it's the most capital-intensive uh, art form, if you want to call it an art form. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and not just that it's capital intensive, but it is also so, um, just to say fundamentally again, material. And as soon as you get up in the space of materiality, a certain kind of, you know, concrete materiality, and that's always going to be like, come with a lot of, um, uh, problematics when it comes to black folks. And it just really comes down to, uh, you know, the fact that, again, like I was saying earlier about subjects and objects, you know, mm-hmm. objects are typically understood as being somewhat more material, uh, fundamentally material than subjects, you know what I mean, so to speak. So, you know, all the sort of expressive modalities that we arrived in the Americas with you know, all of our traditions, you know, expressive traditions, whether they be like musical or, you know, all the sculpture and all those things. I mean, material expressivity might be one of the few things in Africa that is as diverse and as complicated as, you know, musical expressivity. Nevertheless, because of the material nature of that expressivity, it uh, was eroded, you know, it eroded and, uh, you know, was underdeveloped in the context of the Americas. So the architecture thing, you know, is fundamentally bound up that. It's about material. It's about bricks and water and, you know, putting shit in space, you know, in a way that's, um, it's not fugitive. It's not phantom, you know, it's mm-hmm. not spectral. It's real. And it's, you know, quite literally concrete. So, you know, it was just like complicated for me. I just at a certain point, the architects that I admired, you know, you didn't have to dig that deeply to see that in most instances, they were products of, you know, uh, wealthy backgrounds. Uh, Mostly in almost most of the instances, you know, their first sort of commissions were commissions by family members, you know what I mean? Who could afford to, you know, give a son or a daughter you know, a certain amount of money to make something with, you know what I mean? It's Mm -hmm. just like, it's so typical. It's like one of the central tropes. And so, you know, it's very unusual for architects to be women, to be people of color. Now, of course, uh, you know, I say that, but by the same token, there are, of course, thousands, you know. But, I mean, like, relatively speaking, it's something that you you don't see like so often, you know, outside of, you know, David I.J. and, you know, I think of Max Bond, I think of Paul Williams, you know what I mean? But it's like, it may be one of the few fields where there's more on the development than like, you know, cinema, like for black folks, you mm-hmm. know? But I do think most of it, you know, in both instances, the whole kind of material, which then becomes the capital nature of the endeavor, you know, is largely responsible for it, you know, the sort of, you know, relative underdevelopment of it. So it's the material thing. And so that goes back to like, you know, how come black, I like to say not black visual culture because, but black pictorial culture or sculptural culture is like, you know, so behind musical um, culture and stuff. It's, It's very simple. I've said it, you know, a thousand times if I've said it once, which is that, you know, you can carry the music on your nervous system, you know, on a slave ship, on a chain gang, on a plantation, in a cotton field, you know, but you can't carry a sculpture, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. in those spaces. Um, so, you know, so as a consequence, you know, we came here with rich traditions of material expressivity, and it's not to say that there's no uh, so remnants of that, or there are no, 
you know, practitioners, particularly in the South, you know, I think, uh, in Black communities, but by and large, it's relatively speaking, uh, you know, underdeveloped, or as Cornel West said back in the 80s, not apparent, <laughs> which, you know, produced a lot of consternation amongst, you know, Black, um, you know, Black artists at the time. But but I think he was kind of on to something because he basically went on to say that he felt the reason that that was was because, you know, the Black church was the only institution that Black people had. And the Black church, being a Protestant church, had a fundamental problematic with, you know, graven images or, you know, image making, period. Mm-hmm. Unlike the Catholic church, you know. So if you look at places where Black people found themselves in the West that had Catholic, you know, with Catholic societies, Brazil, Haiti, you know, Trinidad, you know, you can think of different places. Those are the places where they have, you know, visual traditions that parallel are in accord with their musical traditions. Mm. But if you go to places where the churches were Protestant, like in most of Black America, there's no, you know, there was a, there, there was no sort of uh, proclivity, you know, there was no subsidy there. Whereas, you know, black song, black dance, even black oratorical stuff, the black church provided a platform and subsidy, you know, uh, for those for those expressive modes, but not not for the visual. Thing, so. hmm. It's not the reason why it didn't exist, but it's one of the reasons why the support wasn't there, you know. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. I, I had not thought about the church basis, but I'm curious in your, you know, own research, have you, or just even observations, have you noticed that there is a more defined pictorial culture amongst the Catholic uh, New World folks? You know what I mean? Like, do you feel like... Yeah, it's undeniable. Or- it's not, it's like, it's just empirically true. Mm-hmm. I don't. I think it's no accident that Basquiat's parents were Puerto Rican and, and Haitian. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think that's. Uh, it doesn't explain everything about who he was, but I. I don't think it's. Um, it's of some consequence. I think of some significance. You know, mm-hmm. Puerto Rico's Catholic, so is Haiti. So yeah, you know, it's, it's, I don't think it's an accident. You know, so. Something else that you've talked a lot about, but just, I think, for this interview, you grew up in Mississippi, and you've talked about Tupelo and Clarksdale and the state overall being ground zero for Black American and thus American culture. And I'm wondering how you feel that in your own practice. Like, how did growing up in those environments shape how you approach your work? I mean, that's an ongoing question. It's like, it's an undeniable, like, you know, central preoccupation of us, but, you know, that centrality is, um, it's not static. You know what I mean? It's like dynamic uh, because particularly as I get older, my relationship to things that I experienced or the way I understand Mississippi or South or um, class, uh, poverty, and underdevelopment in general. And spirituality too, I guess. Um, or metaphysics, which I guess not the same thing as spirituality, but metaphysics, those things all, you know, are all constantly evolving. So my relationship to Mississippi is evolving as well. But but it is true that my background as a southerner has had an indelible and uh, determinant, you know, not just indelible, but pretty determinate um impact on my preoccupations, my interests, the way I approach those interests, the way I think about those interests. Yeah, you know, like I said, it's it's like ongoing. It's not it's not something that's fixed. You know, the way I think about Mississippi now is different from when I thought about it even ten years ago. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is a certain aspect to my own trajectory as a artist. You know, you were saying earlier, like how did I come to be a practitioner in the sort of fine arts realm, I guess. But, you know, and I've had people ask me that at various talks, you know, I've had young black filmmakers ask me, you know, you seem to have sort of chosen the fine arts context over the film context, you know, and I always laugh because, you know, I said, no, I didn't, I didn't choose the artwork. The artwork kind of chose me. Mm -hmm. Like anybody who kind of knows, you know, 
it's not like I didn't even have a history in the art world, but it was a it was a history or a kind of endeavor that I, I had been sort of abandoned, you know, easily like twenty years before. That's because at the time I didn't. Mostly, I just didn't like the context. Honestly, you know, I found it to be relative to the film thing. As sad as that was, you know, and underdeveloped as that was. I didn't. I never felt alienated, you know, mm-hmm. in the context of the black film community, and in the art world, I did. You know, it just uh, it produced a lot of uh, well displeasure. Let's just mm-hmm. call it that. I wouldn't even call it anxiety so much. It's just you know, it was just a lot of um, spending an inordinate amount of energy thinking about myself in relationship to the context, not even like the work, you know, mm-hmm. and. You know, it's funny, like, I was invited to be on this uh, panel for the trustees of the Museum of Modern Art. They have three artists on this panel. Uh, they went to L.A. Apparently, it moves around every year, and they went to L.A. just maybe three years ago, three, four years ago. And, you know, and they were asking me these questions, and at a certain point, I was just like, y'all kill by sky. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like... <laughs> People are sort of you know, taken aback by it. But I was just like, you know, the work for him wasn't any problem. And that's not what killed him. What killed him was all the kinds of various pressures that sort of were exerted on him as a, you know, as a black man in that context. Yeah. And Gene's though he was, you know, he wasn't um he wasn't equipped ultimately to sort of um uh, circumnavigate it or survive it, certainly. I mean, that's indisputable at this point. Um, you know, I used to say, like, with Greg, sometimes they like, he bought a ticket on the train, he couldn't get off, you know, and he knew kind of what it was, but, you know, I remember him saying, like, I want to be the Charlie Parker or the Jimi Hendrix of the art world, <laughs> and I just, like, mm. strange thing to ask for when those, both those guys barely, you know, made 30 like jimmy didn't make 30 so right Kylie did so you know genius though they were so he swallowed uh a kind of um in the wrong pill you know he, he swallowed a paradigm and like i said it was like you know it was a one-way ticket <laughs> to the way he ended up you know and he couldn't get off and it's funny because i can remember back in 81 82 it was impossible if you, you know, I was no musician or anything like that, you know, so hip hop and all that stuff was happening. But, you know, Bosco was happening, subway graffiti was happening. If you were a person who had any sort of visual uh, proclivities as a black person, it was exciting, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, it just seemed like a lot was possible at the time, you know, and I always had an interest, you know, in art so to speak, you know, since I was a kid as well. And, uh, you know, and I think, I mean, not to glom myself up to John Michelle, but we were very, you know, I think it's a generational thing. Mm-hmm. Like, close in age, like literally like four days apart. I think I'm November the 30th, 1960, like December, first week of December, at the exact date. But, you know, not even a week apart. So the things that, he was preoccupied with it. I just think just went with the territory of being a young black man who was, you know, engendered at a particular moment in history, you know, so Mm -hmm. enough to have felt, you know, segregated America. But, um, I mean, old enough to have felt segregated America, but young enough for it to be something in the rearview mirror, you mm-hmm. know, in a way. Uh, remember, you know, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, um, you know, on the radio and understanding that that was a new formulation in the context of pop culture. You know what I mean? It wasn't just, uh, you know, just something somebody was saying, you know? Yeah. Things like that. You know, remembering like black people on television for the first time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, Julia, you know, black people being in color and <laughs> things like that. I, you know, vaguely, but I remember. And then also to grow up in Mississippi too, at the same time that you were experiencing those things. 
you know, you know, I've sort of joked in the past that, you know, the Delta in particular in Mississippi is, uh, just say, it's the Black American Jurassic Park, you know? So, like, on a cultural level, it just was a very intense and rich and uh, scary, you know, in many ways, like, context to grow up in. Um, you know, inherently, like, traumatic kind of environment, you know, I think I'm still working through, like I say, like I say about Black folks, it's like we're perpetually in post-trauma, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it's not like something that happened 60 years ago and, you know, you're having flashbacks. <laughs> it's like it's like having flashbacks while you're still in Vietnam about being in Vietnam, you know? So, right. So, you know, that's that trouble consciousness that I was talking about. It's, uh, you know, it sort of undergirds everything that, you know, I'm preoccupied with. And not just what I'm preoccupied with, but how I'm preoccupied with it, I think. And uh, mm, you know, the art world is, uh, it's interesting. It's interesting. <laughs> interesting <laughs> i mean it's interesting you know um the things about it that i absolutely love i love the fact that by and large and i understand this may not be typical of everybody you know i'm not saying it's just inherently how it always is in our world because many other people haven't had the experiences that i've had but by and large i don't have to convince people about what i want to do you know was the whole thing in film is convincing people you know mm-hmm. the, the script so you can convince people, you know what I mean, that yeah. what you want to do, you know, merits the financial support and capital that's required to do it. You know, you spend an inordinate amount of time, not only trying to convince people what you want to do, but trying to convince people that what you want to do is legitimate. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's not just, I want to make a film about, you know, I don't know, black fishermen in <laughs> San Diego <laughs> in the 1840s or something like that. It's not even just that. Like, okay, this is my narrative and it's going to be an interesting narrative. It's also like you got to convince people that on one hand, that it's commercially, has commercial potential. But beyond that, it's just also that it's a legitimate thing to make about black people. You know what I mean? Even that. Like, yeah. we don't want to get involved in anything that's going to cause any confusion, you know, or something like that. So, but in the art world, I have to say for myself, I'm just, um, you know, I used to have this bad joke, but I used to always say the thing about the film context is like, you know, you always ask for permission to do certain things. And uh, and I say, you know, it's always the case. It's a little bit like, you know, if you have to ask somebody's permission to have a baby, the answer is always going to be yes. You know, if you fuck me. <laughs> and it's kind of like, so you end up with this thing that's it's a product of your desires, but it's somewhat misbegotten because it's bound up with you know, casting couch culture, you know what I mean? Like having to pay off, you know, pay with your flesh, you know, to do the thing that you want to do. And the thing is always in some ways compromised by its inability to autonomously come into being. And uh, the art world, troubled though it may be in many ways, I haven't really had a whole bunch of experience. I mean, even from like as far back as 2000 when I did the show, the first art show I'd ever done, which is, you know, Artist Selects at our artist space. Nobody told me what to do, you know. I did. One of the only advice I even got from Kiki Smith, who was selecting me, was that just take up as much space as you can. <laughs> and when she first said it, I was like, you mean I just should populate, you know, because it was a three-person show. I should just populate the space. And she was like, no, nah, I don't mean it like that. She said, I just mean, like, don't start off narrow. Like, if you're interested in painting, if you're interested in sculpture, if you're interested in performance, don't just show a video because that's what you do. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Show whatever you want to show. Like, don't start off so narrow because what tends to happen is if you start off narrow, then you try to slide into another space, then there's a lot of resistance where... For better or for worse, if you start off as, 
you know, as broadly as your interests are, then there's no, you don't have to re-maneuver, you know? That can happen sometimes. It's happened a little bit at times with me around the whole video art thing, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But um, but nobody's telling me what to do, so it doesn't matter because I don't have to do, I do video art because I like doing it. You know what I mean? I'm not doing it because any sort of pressure is being put on me to do that. You know, as a matter of fact, there's a certain way in which people seem pleasantly surprised that I have all these interests that, you know, supersede like moving image work, you know? And, um, and I don't even really honestly don't even see it as a split personally, but I get it, you know, it's a different kind of thing, but you know, I just like the fact that I don't have to, um, convince anybody. Yeah. But I want to do. I just do it. And like having a child, people take it or leave it. You know what I mean? It's either for them or it's not for them. It's not for them. They just keep stepping. There's a lot of artists out here, you know, like fine artists or, you know, artists in the visual arts realm are in many instances their own means of production. You know what I mean? It's not like whatever it is they do, whether it's make a painting or sculpture or video, they tend to it tends to be a given that they control the means of production of producing that thing that they've already de facto been producing that might bring them to somebody's attention in the first place. It's not like they're coming to somebody and say, I got this idea, I need X amount of money to do it. You know what I mean? They kind of have done something, even if it's not a something that's as elaborate as maybe what they might imagine. You know, it's like, it's the work, the work proceeds, not a script, not a proposal, not a, you know, a sort of description of what they want to do. It's like the thing itself kind of precedes the person, you know? And I, I like that, you know, it's like, you know, shit, I'm always prepared to fight for, you know, the things that I make, you know, I just don't want to have to fight for them before they come into being, you know what I mean? Cause then you end up tangled with this tar baby. <laughs> you can't, you kind of, kind of, you know, become entangled in, in a complicated kind of way. So, I mean, even in terms of directing a feature film, which is, you know, in the docs for me in the next year, I just, um, you know, two, three years ago, like people were like, what do you want to do? Yeah. Like in the film thing. And most, I think I was busy, but beyond that, I just realized that I enjoyed what I was doing in art world. I enjoyed the freedom of it. But I also realized that I wasn't in any rush, you know, to make a movie and that the terms were more important to me than like how much quote unquote money I was going to make or something like that. Cause I just don't need the money. Mm-hmm. I don't, I mean, it's just a reality. I just don't need that. I don't make my living over there. So I'm not going to make a movie after this much time of waiting. That's not exactly what I want to do. And with the terms that I want, you know, mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not just like so burning up to make a feature film that I'm going to make, you know, make it under circumstances that aren't pretty much ideal, you know? realistic or unrealistic it kind of doesn't matter you know it's like even when i've spoken to produce up at this point i just make it really clear from the beginning that like i just want to do what i want to do and it's not about money you know so that scares off about 95 percent of the people just right there <laughs> <laughs> but you know but i guess i'm just kind of um i'm very comfortable with where i'm at right now you know mm-hmm. because I'm working in my own uh, flow, in my own, you know, in pursuit of my own bliss. I'm not, I don't have anything to prove. I may have some things to prove to myself, but, you know, I mean, the things that I want to do, you know, for people who know me for a long time, I'm bound up with, you know, those kinds of questions. Like, what could a black son actually be? It's not about really making a hit film or something like that. Uh, Putting in, you know making a mediocre but successful movie to put yourself in a position to make another mediocre but successful film, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wanted to ask you about that because I think that from the very first moment that I've seen you speak and subsequently, and then, of course, at Black Star early on and, you know, in many, many, many interviews, this idea right. of pursuing a Black cinema or getting Black cinema caught up to where Black music is, I, I wonder for you if you see any shift toward getting closer to that, like, are there, do you feel like the new generation is opening up? At large, you mean, or you mean for me, uh, individual? 
both. Uh, I like to think so. I mean, these are very volatile times. Like, are we even going to have like, movie theaters anymore? You know, nobody really knows mm-hmm. like what's happening. But by the same token, because of streaming and stuff, there's more content being produced than ever. And because these are volatile times, chaotic times, you know, it was chaotic, you know, when Me Too happened. And then it's been chaotic and increasingly so, you know, around, you know, the persistent, you know, murders of black people by police forces. And then you throw COVID on top of that, you know what I mean? Which kind of has bankrupted the theatrical chains and, uh, you know, just throwing everything in the question. So there's a lot of opportunity now, you know, to make things and, um, I mean, I'm optimistic. I'm super optimistic because, you know, you know, so many of the things that I sort of have described or, um, you know, thought about in public are just out of there. They've moved beyond the realm of hypothetical for me at this stage. You know what I mean? Like, I'm really actually doing things that I've been talking about for 30 years, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I used to get into this debate, you know, with one of my closest associates about this, about talking, you know? You know, and he would say, like, I'm just tired of the talking, like, we got we got to do. But the thing is, talking is doing Mm -hmm. as well. It's not like doing like, you know, pointing the camera at something doing, but it's just a different kind of doing. And I'm not sure it's um, that means it's less powerful. I'm not sure of that. As a matter of fact, I would say there's something like emancipatory about. You know, I'm thinking of Will Alexander's book, Black Speech of the Angel, you know, something like that. There's something emancipatory about speaking, obviously, for black people, because it doesn't cost you anything. It's like if you have a piano, you don't have to pay every time you hit a note. You know what I mean? On the piano, once you got the piano, well, you know, everybody has a vocal cord, you know, and it's one of the fundamental things that, that you know, that came with the black body. So there's something about sharing one's visions of what a thing can be. That's, you know, like a legitimate um, endeavor. And it's an, it's something that, you know, most people who know me would say part and parcel of who I am, you know, but I do think, you know, over time I started to feel like you can't tell anybody anything. Mm. Like you can, you can try to tell people things, but even if people like it, they don't necessarily get it. Like you have to show people, mm-hmm. you know. So I'm not really, you know, there's a handful of films. As anybody knows me knows that I've quote unquote critiqued, but like over a thirty some forty almost forty year career at this point, like I haven't critiqued very many films at all. Like in per, you know, in public. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have. I'm not like a person who's out here trash and you know <laughs> sort of products of black filmmakers like in public for sure but i also am a person who i think is gen- generally understood as to be somewhat of um you know a heartline around some of these things you know i think it's cool when people make films worthy of applauding for having made a film i still think that's worthy of applauding a person but i think we do ourselves a disservice when we improperly assess or valorize or value certain of the majority of the moves that we make. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's like I've said before, like, I think some people out here are winning at winning, but they're not winning at cinema. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I do. Cinema is just the space that they're winning in. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's all right. It's cool. Look, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But, you know, I don't know why I pick on these guys because they're really great, but I'll just say this. <laughs> Much as I love Frankie Beverly and Mays, there just ain't no John Coltrane or no Aretha Franklin. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, it's just like evidence of how incredible black music is that maybe a six or seven tier band is amazing. Yeah. Like they're kind of amazing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But like cinema, nah. You know, if there's a spirit animal to black cinema, we wound that thing when we make these claims. But things that just don't merit it, you know, just yeah. because a black person made them. Yeah. I mean, we should sub- celebrate those things because they were successfully done, you know, as endeavors, which is a thing to celebrate. Right. But not as uh, black people know, like they can go to a party and dance a song and it can be a great thing to dance to. But they don't confuse it with, you know, whatever it is, their own metrics of 
the best of the best is. They don't confuse that. We're very aristocratic when it comes to music. Not aristocratic in the sense of being Catholic, you know, about it. I mean, you know, we like all kinds of shit, you know what I mean? And all of it's not quote unquote serious, but we are very much into the aesthetic power of the thing speaking for itself, you know, asserting itself. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you went to an Ivy League school or Juilliard or something like that, or if you just, you know, a person who doesn't even read music. <laughs> it doesn't matter. None of that shit matters to us. All we care about is the thing, mm-hmm. you know, is the thing dope, you know? Sometimes people ask me, well, what are you going for? I just say, like, dope. I want shit to be dope. And people think, like, you're being, trying to be provocative or evasive or something like that. And it's like, nah, it's not. I just want to make dope shit. You know what I mean? And um, and with cinema, I mean, we made so much dope shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's just the reality of it. We made a lot of really dope shit. And if you put the dope things next to the 99% of the shit we have made, it's just clearly not in the same realm of being you know it's just not and it's like i mean not being able to tell a difference between the two is as much evidence of how underdeveloped black film culture is as anything you know but that state of underdevelopment is not just a phase i almost feel like it's something the the sort of tension between that underdevelopment and the sort of enormous possibility of it is a signature or central dimension of the complexity of what black cinema is and can be, you know, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? The tension between those two things. So, you know, so killer sheet, you know, you can add whatever other family want to add. It's just like, you don't have to, I don't have to downplay anything else. I just say killer sheet. You know what I mean? <laughs> if you get it, you get it. Like Bob Marley say, he who feels it knows it. You know what I mean? If you don't feel it. You don't know it. That's all right too. That's cool. But, you know, but, there are things out here that Black folks have made that operate on a level, I would say, equal to Black music. It's just not sustained you know, for all the obvious structural, financial, sociopolitical, you know, reasons. Um, but like, yeah, the work, the work, we, you know, we, we produce masterworks, you know. But, you know, like sometimes I use... I know Julie hates what I do, but I, I, I persist in doing it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I think of like I always think of like Julie is like daughters of dust. I mean, did anybody outside of maybe two or three people make a better debut feature film than Julie Dash? Right. Not black filmmaker, period. American filmmakers. Very few. Mm-hmm. Very few. Very, very few. Um even on this level. And the thing about it, and I don't say that just because I, you know, I was a collaborator. I mean, just objectively, I think it's true at this point. Mm-hmm. And, um, but the fact of the matter is that's her debut feature film. Mm-hmm. Like that's the first film she made over 40 minutes long, mm-hmm. period. I don't mean, I mean, she didn't do a bunch of television and then get a chance. I mean, that is it. Right. Right. And the thing about it is like, it's, a, I, I, you know, I've said this before. It's like, it's like, Toni Morrison's first novel, like The Bluest Eye. That's her bluest eye. Right. If you take the analogy to have some merit, then if Daughters of the Justice are bluest eye, what would her song of Solomon have looked like? Mm-hmm. Well, beloved, you know, we we can't, we don't even know. We don't even know. And Julie's not like me or some other people I know who was trying to figure it out. She had a stack of scripts ready to go. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you can't, it's like, and that's not, She's not unique in that way. There is a phenomenon of the sort of masterful one-off that we see amongst Black filmmakers, you know, who mm-hmm. make that amazing first film. And for all the various structural, you know, reasons, they don't seem to be able to build on that, you know? They don't seem to be able to follow that and supersede. I mean, like, if Toni Morrison had only written The Blue Is I, I mean, it's a good book. A great book, perhaps, but you know, that Tony Morrison wouldn't have had anything to do with the Tony Morrison in our of the universe. You know what I mean? Yeah. It just wouldn't have been. I don't know that she would be remembered as being like so significant. I mean, maybe by the time she gets to Sula, but even if you do Sula, 
that then put you in the zone of like the one amazing thing if that's all she did. You know what I mean? It'd be one amazing thing, but it wouldn't be like nobody would be out here talking about, you know, she should get a Nobel Peace Prize or literature or anything, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, if you take daughters just as a sort of emblematic example, it's just like Julie still is and has been for 30 years capable of a lot more than she quite literally has been allowed to do. And I don't mean that figuratively because there's so many things, so many experiences. I've known Julie for a long time. Like she's a warrior. You know, I've seen her burn bridges. She got black balls at one point. I mean, just for real, just because she refused to acquiesce. And I'm, I don't mean like, I mean like for real, like for real shit. I cannot even repeat, you know, I'm not talking about no figurative shit. I'm talking about people literally told her, bitch, you will never direct in Hollywood again because mm. she refused to, you know, have a character doing the movie, some backward ass shit yeah. that they insisted on. Yeah. And it's like, no, I didn't come here to do that. I didn't come here to misrepresent that person. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I feel, I was telling somebody the other day, like, I feel like, you know, Roy Batty at the end of Blade Runner, he says, little man, the things I've seen, you know what I mean? I've seen <laughs> the starship burning off Orion or something like this. It's just like, people like to act like this world is different from the world, you know, our forebears grew up in. And yeah, there's more opportunities, no doubt about that. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, <laughs> I mean, when you see something like, you know, the leaks of the Sony emails and then the Me Too shit happens, you realize, no, this is no aberration. Right. This is like a rape culture. Right. You know what I mean? And all this stuff. No, police killing black people is not abnormal. That's normal. Right. That's normal. And it's the same thing in terms of like black filmmakers. Oh, they, they blocked us and all this. No, that shit is not fiction. That shit is not imagined. It's real. It's very, very, very real. And it's not like saying there's some star chamber out here doing it. That's just not how it works. Like, people think, like, you know, if you don't have, like, a star chamber and um, and you're a car carrier member of some group and stuff, that it's not a conspiracy, you know? But sometimes that's why it's called structural racism. You know what I mean? Because yeah. the individual folks might not be quote unquote bad people, whatever that means, you know what I mean? But the way it works. But in addition to that, there's also people out here who said, yo, you're going to do it the way I told you to do it. Like in some, like you would think if you tried to represent it in the movie, it would just look like some over the top, you know what I mean? Like Lovecraft County kind of shit. But that shit is real. It's real out here. It's not like, it's not no figment of nobody's imagination, you know? So, you know, fortunately, everything changes, you know? Yeah. Everything changes. So it evolves, and, you know, I've seen it in my own life. It's just the terms, the conditions, the possibilities shift, and, you know, and in those in those terms, uh, you know, other, other things become possible. And like I said, it's the thing, it's like when they use a the term, they say you decimate a people to decimate someone. Because it's a group, you can't decimate an individual. You can only decimate a group. Mm -hmm. And that just means like you kill one in 10. You can't kill everybody. If you kill everybody, there's nobody to do your labor or buy your products. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you you kill one in 10. It's a disciplining. It's a disciplining action. It's an action that's meant to traumatize and put everybody else in place. But the flip side of that, and this is why these disciplinings are necessary to maintain, you know, power and control. Because the flip side of that is when one person supersedes this thing, everybody knows it's possible. Mm-hmm. Because, like, one of the things that we're convinced, one of the worst things we're convinced is not that this is just the best of possible universes, we've been convinced that this is the only possible universe. Mm-hmm. If you say it's the best of possible universe, if you say this is the best society, that begs the question, by what metric, by what criteria? That's a very different from this is just reality and this is how it is. That's a very different thing. So when people, when individuals 
or small groups of faith. I love one of the things that Robin Kelly said, I think is one of the most genius like observations that I've heard in the last 30 years. It's just as like incorrect to call the civil rights movement a mass movement. It was never a mass movement. It was an aggregate movement. It's the way people are taught to teach it as a mass movement. It disempowers it because it gives the impression that unless 99.9% of black people agree on something and do it collectively, change can't happen. And that's just not the truth. You know, like you can just look at the films of like, you know, people being water hose and, you know, attacked by dogs and stuff. There's like more people, black people standing on the side while watching it happen than it's happening too. That was a small cadre of people affected that change. You know what I mean? Made the sacrifice. Everybody benefited from it. Not just black folks. Everybody benefited from it. But it was no mass movement. It was never a mass movement, you know? You're listening to Mini Lumens, brought to you by Black Star. This is Arthur Jaffer, and you're listening to Many Moments. I was curious what your observation would be of the uprising. I've been calling it, you know, the American Spring, but the protest that erupted after George Floyd's murder and this, I think, amplifying of Black Lives Matter in this moment. Having lived through a Black Power moment, how do you do you see that there is a difference now, particularly related to the art making that is coming out of the moment as well? Well, first of all, I was alive during the Black Power movement. I wouldn't say I lived through it. I was like, well, I mean, five years, you were a child, yeah. Years. Yeah, I was a child, and I wasn't a child in no Black Panther group or nothing like that. You know what I mean? It wasn't like my parents. I mean, they were certainly like you know Black progressives. I would say, but not like they weren't. You know, ain't like Tupac's parents or nothing like that. They were no members of no BLA or nothing like that. They were just that generation of Black folks who thought my parents are teachers. The education mattered. You know what I mean? And they took it on themselves to educate the future generations of Black folks. I have that played out, you know. So they were the striking, you know. You know, the, the group of my father was like the president of like the student council at Alcorn University when they shut it down and shut the school down, you know? And so that whole, his whole class, none of them graduated from Alcorn because they shut the school down and, you know, they had to go other way. The school just stopped for a year. Mm. So I would never say I lived through the black power moment. It was something I didn't even become conscious of per se in the sort of uh, precise sense of it as a movement and what its political and ideological parameters were. No, I just sort of got the fallout from it. Like, you know, say it loud, I'm black and my pop I'm black and I'm proud. That's what I picked up. But you know, by the time I got to Howard, of course, I became very aware of what the black arts movement all these things were. But I didn't know anything about that before I got to Howard, you know. So but like, you know, I'm you know, I'm no pundit, man, already, you know, so I don't like like what's the difference between then and now? I don't know. You know, I don't know what the difference is. I think that um Everything that happened wasn't because a black person got killed, you know, Mm -hmm. because black somebody got killed the week before George Floyd and the week after George Floyd. And people have continued to be killed since then. Yeah. And there's no rising. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's an ongoing uprising. But you know what I mean? It's not the explosion that happened on the George Floyd. The George Floyd thing is specifically tied to two things. And I'm not placing any value judgment. I don't mean to diminish or magnify it but there are two critical things that i think that are very different about that than anything else that we can kind of point to 
One being, of course, is that we saw the life drain out of that brother's eyes on the camera. Yeah. Like, even like, Love is a Message, which has Black people being killed in it. But, you know, like, even with Walter Scott, I think it's Walter Scott in the beginning when he's running away. You don't know that he's dead. You just see he's running and he falls. Yeah. People fall all the time. You know what I mean? You don't see that he's no longer breathing or they don't call the ambulance. You know, you know, you don't know. But we've never seen, like, that was the closest thing to, like, a straight-up lynching. Like, when you see, like, with our sanctuary, when you saw a person's life drain out of I'm not saying Black people haven't seen it, but I mean, in as far as, like, you know, these videos and stuff. Yeah. Nobody ever seen a person cry for their mama and then die on camera. It's just, like, there's no precedent for it. I think white people saw it and looked in the mirror and they could not look away from what they saw in that moment. Like, cause you know, like people would say always like, oh, some black people, you know, so many white folks say this or young white people say this, like, oh, so-and-so got into it with a cop. They must've done something. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like a reflex. They must've done something. They must've not put their hands. They don't, uh, you know, they were just saying like, Young people, white folks who confront their parents, like, you see this? And their parents say they must have done something. It's like, my God, what the fuck do you have to do to have somebody just murder you? And slow, slowly, not shoot you, murder you, like, in real time. Yeah. And then, like, you know, as everybody, you know, this shit is just a given on Instagram and social media. You know, you got, like, kid with guns going out killing people. And they just stop him at McDonald's and feed him before they take the sale. It's just like, you can't make this shit up. You cannot make this shit up. And so so that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect of it is COVID, of course, you know? Mm -hmm. That's the aspect of it. I just think there's a certain part of it is just people were just like wilding out. You know, they were like frustrated with just having sequestering and stuff. And so it became, I think, on some level, a rational reason to no longer sequester, you know? Mm -hmm. I've seen people say it as like, they put their freedom before their health or something like that. You know, but that's like, um, you know, it's just a rationalization in a sense. People have done and continue to do what they think they must, you know? But I just don't, I don't know that I necessarily, I mean, I, I like, I have to be really careful about this because I'm not making any, I'm not attempting to make any sort of judgments of Black Lives Matter or mm -hmm. the various groups and stuff that are involved, some of which I support, some of which I don't necessarily support. I don't necessarily support the way they're going about things. That yeah, I mean, mean I, AJ, I, I, I wasn't I, asking you to make an assessment, so I apologize if it came off like that. I'm more so thinking about the cultural and artistic movements that came but with the, same. you know. It's all the same. It's all the same to me. Okay. It's like Baraka, ever-changing saying. No, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. This is what we do. We make shit. We try to make shit about the world. Sometimes we make things that resonate for our community. Sometimes we make things that resonate for the community at large, you know, society at large. Those are not, I don't, I don't collapse the two. I don't, I don't misunderstand the two. I know, like, like Black Star was the first place that ever showed, you know, my shit, really. And then it was the first place I was ever sort of recognized or rewarded, you know, awarded anything. Mm. And so it doesn't mean that, like, when the New York Film Festival showed the film, like, nine months later, that I don't value that or that I overvalue, you know, that because of that. It's just, like, two different things. I know one is inside and one is, like, you know, in the larger, larger kind of world and stuff. But like, you know, as much as people want to construct, oh, Arthur J. came from out of the blue as a, you know, in the art world or something, there ain't very many people who don't, you know what I mean? Like in the black arts thing, I'm not talking about, I don't know, you know, I don't know about black Hollywood or anything like that, but, but people who are involved in the black arts thing, the black cinema thing, I think I'm a pretty known entity, you know, after 30 <laughs> years of being out here. So, like, yeah. I think people were surprised at the level of the success, but ain't nobody just, you know, 
find out who I am or something like that. You know, I'm just like, I'm an OG. I've just been in the game a long time. I mean, I think, you know, some people may overvalue the nature of my success now, you know? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't necessarily. I think a lot of people is like, yeah, that nigga was always crazy. He was always, (laughs) he was always like on some other shit. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think, I don't think I've made anything. Me, I could be wrong about this, my word, but I don't think I've made anything that anybody who knows me felt like it was some shit that was way beyond my capacity. I made some quantum leap or something. Yeah. I don't think so. I think more people would have wondered if I ever was going to make anything, maybe, mm-hmm. for all the other you know reasons that could be from structural to like mental health issues or whatever. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I don't think anybody would have been surprised if I didn't. But I also think nobody was surprised when I did. Right. Right. And I think most people were like genuinely happy for me. I don't think I've received so little sour grapes. It's incredible. Like, Mm -hmm. I just thought I would have received more. I kind of miss it. I've sort of longed for it on a certain level, you know. I used to say, like, yeah, nobody critiques me, you know, nobody pushes back. And so I said, oh, that's critique out here, but not in my face. I don't know. Ain't nobody out here. Well, you know, now uh, you're winning at winning. You've joined the ranks. Oh, yeah, I guess that's what it is. They can't <laughs> winning at winning and winning at center, you know what I mean, or whatever. But you know what I'm saying? Anybody who knows me knows I'm I'm a discourse yeah. It's not more argumentative, you know? So mm-hmm. I like, it's not about Sagittarius. Come in some kind of, yeah, maybe it is Sagittarius. It's not like come for me. It's just like, I like arguing about shit. And it's like, I've, ne- I've only ever heard one thing that was one might interpret as being negative by Love is a Message. Mm-hmm. That was like, I have to be on Instagram. And somebody posted something, got to see Love is a Message. And then it just was a thread for some reason. <laughs> I don't normally read those threads. Mm-hmm. But next thing I find myself, I don't know if it's just somebody said it in a certain way. I find myself reading the thread. And I must have gotten now like 60 comments into the thread. And this person just said, boring. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that from like, you know what I mean? I remember that from like three, four years ago. I mean, I want to send them a print or something. You know what I mean? Like, like for real, like no pushback. You know, no pushback at all. And it's, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I'm too successful or whatever to be fucked with or if people just genuinely love me to the point that they don't, you know, they want to articulate a problem. You know what I mean? What would I do? I don't know what it is, but I'm just kind of like, God damn, somebody, is it really only one person? And this is a fairly recent person mm-hmm. started to say some, you know, very critical things about kind of me in general, I guess. But, you know, I'm also, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a somewhat of an Olympian realm now too. So, you know what I mean? I don't have to, I don't have to respond to anything. So. You know, this person that <laughs> they published this thing that said, uh, they posted this thing that said, Arthur Jaffa is the make a maker of like mediocre vines. He's a nib- neoliberal maker of mediocre vines. Now I was like, mm. the vines part, I don't have a problem with. Mm-hmm. Nothing's wrong with vines, vines are cool. I don't think it's mediocre because I think if it was just mediocre, it wouldn't have had the success. If, you know what I mean? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. I think it's, it may not be like the greatest thing ever made, but it's not mediocre. And I don't think I'm a neoliberal, but hey, anything's <laughs> fine. But, you know, and so when they sent it to me, right, you know what I mean? So when you, if somebody sends something to you on Instagram, you read it. Yeah. So I read it, I didn't respond to it. And then, but I thought what they were saying in general and their thread and stuff was interesting. So I followed them. And then the next thing they posted this whole thing and like, you got some nerve to follow me after I critique you or something like that. Now I'm just thinking to myself, and maybe this is some back channel communication, but I was like, that wasn't no fucking critique. That was an assertion. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's a big difference between the two. 
Yeah. But in the end, vision, I appreciate it. You know what I mean? Maybe I'm just twisted enough that I'm flattered by it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, but some of it's just because it's just been so little, like pushback. You know what I mean? It's just like, Black people just want somebody to love, I guess, or something, you know? I mean, I think, <laughs> yeah. like you said, it's just in some ways bound up with this uh, winning at winning. You know, I'm succeeding. Yeah. So people feel like, I don't know, shit, I don't know what people feel like. All I know is there's an absence of critique, you know what I mean? Like, some of the obvious things you think might people might say just around the sort of, I hazard to call it the centrality, but the presence of black death, you know, and mm-hmm. my it's like couldn't be more obvious. You know, I've been the essay called My Black Death. I got a film film called Dreams of Cola to Death, and then I got <laughs> Lose the Message, the Message is Death. <laughs> I Yo, mean, the is also, it's kind of a. <laughs> I mean, look, somebody tried to, I remember, you know, me and Greg, me and Greg just talked at Gavin Browns in Harlem. Like, fairly early on when Love is the Message had dropped. And um, somebody said something to me, and I was like, yo, I appreciate people who do uplift, but it's just not what I do. Yeah. It's not what I do. Like, people are uplifted by some of the things that I do do. I mean, like, I think, you know, like, A Kingdom Come at Dad's church family is pretty uplifting. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's not it's not my impulse. My, You know, I say I'm a grave digger. I'm an undertaker. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I mean that's my impulse is to go down. Like I, do, I love John Coltrane as an artistic model, you know, in terms of how he mastered his instrument and pursued. And I love some A.B. Spellman, I think, said John Coltrane was so amazing because you saw him work himself into a genius. You know what I mean? But I identify emotionally with Miles, who you couldn't, you know, can't call Miles a hero. He was like an unrepentant wife wife abuser you know what i mean but but emotionally i more like identify with with that work you know what i mean Mm -hmm. um and i think there is something subaltern there is something underworldly about miles's work you know yeah i mean the underworld in the sense of the realm of both things that are problematic but also the realm of the unconscious the realm of the kind of psychoanalytic the realm of the sort of unprocessed, properly processed, you know, the realm of trauma. Yeah. Trauma is horror. I mean, those are the spaces that I'm I'm kind of drawn to. And I don't think, I mean, you ain't got to scratch so far in my work to see what it is that I'm fixated on, you know? Yeah. It makes me think about Richard Nichols once sent me a text and said, when life gives you lemons, get liminal, <laughs> you know? No, I never heard that. One. <laughs> yeah, I know that you have so many incredible artists and theorists that you are in, you know, friends with, grew up with in some ways. And I was wondering if you have a council that you go to for your own. If you're not getting this critique externally, do you have like an in-house council that you take your work to or take your ideas to to get their feedback and work through them? Not really. Not really. No. I mean, I have a, you know, a close, close circle of friends, but, you know, like, I'm thinking of different people, like, obviously, Greg would be one person, but that's like, you know, critiquing yourself in the mirror or something, to a certain degree, not yeah. after being friends for 40 years, you know what I mean? And yeah. then I have, you know, you know, really close friends like Sadi and Tina Camp, and, you know, I mean, it's just maybe possible that they just are so aligned with the general project that, you know, there's nothing. I remember Sadia saying very, very early on, I weary of all this black death, but she wasn't even saying it in particular about my work. She was just saying it in general, you mm-hmm. know? Um, but, you know, did you read that thing she she wrote in Bond Magazine called The Death of White Supremacy? Yes. I mean, I was like, this shit is bleak. Yeah. I told her this is the bleakest thing I've ever, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's bleak. It was very bleak. And so, you know, Che Agassett, um, Tourmaline's brother, he said this really brilliant thing. And I, I just can't, I can never get around for, you know, for whatever reason, my brain has scrambled it. But it was something to the effect, and hopefully somebody out there will be able to correct this. It was something to the effect that, ah, man, I want to say something. It's something like, 
black optimism or black hope is not the absence of optimism. It's, it, I, I'm angling it now. It I was something like I can get it. Um, I can reach out to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something like being, you know, being invested in the future. It's not the absence of like hope. It's the ap- absence of optimism or something like that. I might be getting it completely backwards, but. You know, it's just like there's certain things that I hear, certain things that even when I say them, I'm like, that is true. Mm -hmm. Like I was talking to somebody and, you know, they were going on about this movie that made all this money and they were just going on and on about it. And I wasn't saying anything. I wasn't trying to pick a fight. I wasn't trying to critique it. I just was not saying anything. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of the movie. Mm -hmm. Right. And they just kept going on and on. And then at a certain point when I didn't, I didn't get a name. It was like, what, you have a problem with it? <laughs> and I was like shrugging my shoulders. And then at a certain point, I said, but it made a billion dollars. Mm-hmm. And I just said, so did slavery. Mm. So what the fuck, you know? <laughs> what, what the fuck does that mean? Making a billion dollars is great. Making a billion dollars. But hey, the Nazis made a billion dollars. You know it's not like a an achievement that's like inherently, you know what I mean, like ethically sound or something like that. It's like, what does that what does that mean? So, yeah. anyway, I mean, I'm just rambling now. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of Mini Lumens. Visit us at minilumens.com to subscribe and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Mini Lumens. Mini Lumens is brought to you by Blackstar. This episode was produced by Patrice Worthy and Farah Rahman, edited by David Adams and engineered by Mike Mahalik. Our music supervisor is Rashid Zakat. Our theme song was composed by Vijay Mohan and remixed by David DJ Little Dave Adams. Sending you light and see you next time.